We are two episodes into She-Hulk's Rampage on Disney+, and I've got my thoughts on both of them right now. This episode is brought to you by Mint Mobile. To get your new wireless plan for 15 bucks a month, go to mintmobile.com slash Merle, and stay tuned after this review for more info. Hello, everybody, and welcome to my review of the first two episodes of She-Hulk, my wardrobe today. Completely coincidental. Sometimes you just happen to grab the shirt of the thing you're reviewing that day. I'm wearing my 3,000 Years of Longing shirt tomorrow. So some of you might be saying, well, wait a minute, Dan, you already did a She-Hulk review, and that is true. I did do a non-spoiler review of the first four episodes that ran here on the channel last week, but... I wanted to keep looking at the show weekly, number one, for these first few episodes because I can go into spoilers now that it's actually airing on Disney+, Plus, and also because after the first four, I'll be getting fresh eyes and really want to talk about what's happening. By the way, because this is my first spoiler episode for She-Hulk specifically, just a disclaimer, I know that there are a lot of videos that get into all of the Easter eggs and all the little hidden things that you might have missed and comic book references. That's not really what I do. I talk a lot more about my thoughts on story and humor, etc. I know that there were so many references to things like potentially World War Hulk storylines and a Wolverine thing that people noticed. Uh, there are a lot of people that comb these episodes and do great videos breaking down all those Easter eggs and things. That's not what this video is, but I hope that you can find and enjoy some of those other ones if that's what you're looking for. So let's talk about the first two episodes, episode two, which just came out, episode one, which premiered last week. And I will acknowledge, first of all, if you saw my non-spoiler review, I was not the biggest fan of the series so far. I don't hate it, but I'm very in the middle about it and kind of eh, on it. And I acknowledge that I am very, very much in the minority, it seems, especially amongst the critical community. And I probably could have just sat back and let the show pass by, knowing that a lot of people are probably going to disagree with me. But at the same time, I think it's important just to talk about about this stuff and just share what I liked and I do like some stuff, share what I didn't like and I don't like some stuff and talk about the show like any other Marvel show. So let's start with the first episode, which was the pilot episode, I guess you would call it, that premiered last week on Disney+. Plus. Although, I don't know if you call it a pilot, because there was really no chance that this show wasn't going to get picked up. A large part of this first episode was the origin story of She-Hulk, and I thought that the origin story was fine. It was a little too quick and easy, maybe, with just a couple of drops getting into Jen's arm, and then she becomes the She-Hulk. But at the same time, we've seen in the MCU that just one drop of this stuff knocked Stan Lee on his ass, so I'm gonna roll with it. Could it have been done better in my eyes? Sure, but you also have a lot of stuff to get to in this episode. I said last week, and I'll reiterate again here, that I think that Tatiana Maslany is a great choice for Jen Walters and She-Hulk. I think that she plays the comedy well. I think she plays the more dramatic moments well. We've known that she was a really, really good actress for a while, but that doesn't always mean that you're gonna be the exact right person for the part. There was one scene in particular in the first episode that I thought Maslany did a great job in where Jen talks to Bruce about her anger. And I have seen a, a lot of stuff in social media, etc., talking about the importance uh, potentially of the scene because it's possible, especially for many young viewers, that it's the first time they've been exposed to that point of view. And I see the value in that. I really do. I'm great at controlling my anger. Mm. I do it all the time because if I don't, I will get called emotional or difficult or might just literally get murdered. My only pushback really on that scene would be something that the first episode does a couple of times, and I think a little bit unnecessarily, and that would be Jen sort of putting herself directly in competition with Bruce, and I'm not talking physically, I'll talk about that in a second, but just as far as positioning herself, and the end of the scene that I just talked about does that. I'm an expert at controlling my anger because I do it infinitely more than you. I think that the choice was made there, yes, to make a statement about society, but also I think to show why Jen and why She-Hulk is so powerful and why she's able to control the two sides of her persona and her personality uh, more easily than Bruce was. I actually think the rest of the episode explained that very well, and I think that these couple of passages where she puts herself in competition with Bruce invites a little more scrutiny that's maybe not needed. On the flip side of the coin, though, I don't think that the intention was to make Bruce look weak, and I've seen some complaints to that effect. People looking at the boulder scene, where Bruce throws a boulder, and then She-Hulk throws a boulder farther. People criticizing that scene in particular, I think that's an example of lazy criticism, or kind of fitting the facts to your own agenda, because if you watch that full scene, 
Bruce throws a boulder, She-Hulk throws a boulder, and then the Hulk throws a boulder into outer freaking space. So it's not like the scene is saying, look how much stronger She-Hulk is than the Hulk. It was very obvious, I think, to anybody that's approaching that with an open mind that he was taking it a little easy because he's doing training and she's basically saying, I don't need you to take it easy on me. And he's saying like, okay, fine. So this is what I'm gonna do. That's why I always say that there is a middle ground when we're talking about these shows. It's not extremes one way or the other. I mentioned in my first review that because I was kind of middling on the show that a lot of people were saying like, well, you know, you've got some kind of internalized misogyny or you're sexist or whatever. And I, I really don't think that's the case. And I think looking at my other reviews or really anything that I've done over my many, many years on YouTube will show you that it's the exact opposite. Opposite. It's just that there are a lot of things, most of which don't have anything to do with the messaging or anything social, just didn't agree with me on this show. A lot of people would say that taking the middle ground is weakness, but I would say that taking the middle ground sometimes just shows that you can have different opinions about something without having to feel like you're here or here. And that's really how I feel about this show in general. When we're talking about Bruce and Jennifer, I think that they had a really good connection. I buy that they have been relatives for a very long time, even though we haven't really heard anything about Bruce's family in the MCU before. A lot of that is because Mark Ruffalo and Tatiana Maslany have great chemistry as actors. I don't know if there were chemistry reads done before they did the casting, but it works and they work together. I also like that the first episode references Bruce's relationship with Tony. I like the fact that in these shows, we are referencing characters that aren't necessarily going to show up, but that makes this show feel like it's part of an ongoing history. There's something else that we'll address in just a moment where I kind of felt the opposite. But those moments were very sweet where Bruce is remembering his friend who's now gone. Tony built it for me a few years ago. He used to joke that it was a loner, that one day he'd just swing by and take it back. One beat that I didn't like so much was the obligatory fight between Hulk and She-Hulk. This is an age-old Marvel trope where our heroes have to fight each other, even if they're already friends, because it makes for a good action sequence. I am glad that it was a short-lived fight and our heroes could get back to bonding over Cheetos, because Frito-Lay has apparently bought a controlling interest in the MCU. Chip, sure. Okay, you're doing great. You're doing great. Look at... Mm. Mm. Uh. But there's one reference to a legacy MCU character that I wasn't a fan of, and I mentioned it kind of obliquely in my non-spoiler review, and that is Captain America. And I will say up front, I understand why so many people love the Captain America joke from the end of the first episode. Steve Rogers is not a virgin. He lost his virginity to a girl in 1943 on the USO tour. I knew it. Captain America, fuck! Captain America's virginity? has been a topic of discussion for many times. We discussed it at Screen Junkies many times, which sounds weird now that I'm saying it out loud. And I understand why you wanna take that topic and make a big moment out of it. But for me, as a fan of the character, it just didn't quite jibe with the Captain America that we know in the MCU. Now, I'm not anti-Cap getting laid. That man put more on the line for this country than just about anybody in the history of the United States of America. I just don't think it quite falls in line with the character that we saw in the MCU. He was always very inept with any woman other than Peggy. And I'm just not a fan of imagining him uh, boning down with a random girl in some tent in Germany during a USO tour. But... That's just my personal preference. I don't hold it against the people that like that joke. It just to me felt like this one-off joke without a whole lot of reverence to the character as established by the MCU, but also realizing that the fictional virginity of a fictional character isn't really that big of a deal. The first episode ends with Titania busting into the courtroom. I wasn't a fan of the music there. The music in general on this series, I think, is a bit cheesy. It's not one of my favorite MCU scores. And then we haven't seen Titania yet, and, and I haven't seen anything, really, of her. It seems like she's going to be coming into the last two-thirds of the series, or last half. So I really feel that a lot of my opinion on the season is probably going to have to do with her storyline, which I haven't seen anything of yet. So that's something I'm looking forward to in the next few weeks after we run past episode four. But let's look at the second episode, which was this week's episode, where we get a little bit more into the flow of the show. Show. A lot has been said about the visual effects in this show. I think they look all right in some scenes, but the bar scene in this episode in particular, I thought She-Hulk looked 
really rough. The VFX just weren't quite there yet. I don't know if it was the lighting. I don't know exactly what it was, but I wonder if this played into the decision, apparently after the scripts were written, for them to write more of the series with Jennifer as Jennifer instead of Jennifer as She-Hulk. And you could see that a couple of times in this episode, actually. Could you uh, go back to Jen? Jen, this is a serious conversation. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You can't come in like that. No superpowers inside. The second episode established the underlying premise for the show, and I actually like the premise, the fact that she is fired from the DA's office as a liability. She has trouble finding a job as a lawyer because people don't want the distraction. I think that that is 100% understandable and relatable as a concept. I also think the idea of getting hired by this rival law firm to head up a division that is specifically about superhuman and superhero law is a good idea. So I think what the show has done really well is to come up with a premise that could lead to some very interesting ideas. Jen's first case is the parole of Emil Blonsky, also known as the Abomination. And for a legal show, I actually really liked this legal defense. They spelled it out very well. It's compelling. The idea that Abomination has been in prison all of this time, but really it was the U.S. government that shot him up with super soldier serum and pointed him to the Hulk and said, this guy's a threat. So why is he all of a sudden the villain and the Hulk is a hero? You know, I've sent on a mission to take out a, a threat I thought, oh, I thought I was the good guy. If you're running a legal show, you have to have some pretty compelling legal arguments. And I thought that this was a really good one, even though we don't really see it deployed in this episode. We haven't really seen Blonsky since 2008, and uh, he's now very quirky because this is a very quirky show. Tim Roth, though, is obviously having a good time, and I'm all for Tim Roth having fun. My tiny ears here. If I were your attorney, I would advise you to speak truthfully. That's all from my heart, Jen. It's not my favorite turn for the character, but it looks like we're going to see what happens next week and we'll see what develops. Something that hit me a little bit harder even in this episode, which is my second watch of episode two, than my first one, was the fourth wall break. I noted in my first review in general that I thought it was a little inconsistently deployed, and this episode was actually one of them because we have only one real extended fourth wall break. There's a brief one when she's talking to Bruce. There's one at the very end of the episode. But it is odd that you introduce this as a storytelling convention and then only do it once or twice per episode. It's not that I mind the fourth wall break, and I know a lot of people last week were like, well, you obviously don't know the comics. It comes from the comics. I understand that it comes from the comics, and I don't have any problem with it as a storytelling device. It's just about how it's used. And it seems in the show so far, like there's no real rhyme or reason about when they decide to use it. So that's something else that I hope gets more consistent over the season, because I think that Tatiana Maslany does those moments well. They're just so sporadic that every time one happens, it sort of catches me by surprise. We introduced a couple new side characters this week. First and foremost, Mark Lynn Baker as Jen's dad. I know he will not be a familiar face to a lot of people, but for me, it means that we are one step closer, or really one step in the door, for a Perfect Strangers reunion in the MCU, because Mark Lynn Baker was one of the two leads of the ABC sitcom Perfect Strangers. Please, somebody, cast Bronson Pinchot as a crazy Banner cousin. As a matter of fact, who cares? Cast him as Balky. He could be Crazy Balky Banner, Bruce's cousin. For those of us that remember Perfect Strangers, we demand Bronson Pinchot in the MCU. It's very Kennedy-like there. It's always great to see Mark Lynn Baker, and I thought that Jin's dad was fun in a sitcom kind of way, but I think that the mark of a good comedy is also a strong supporting cast, and in general, I don't think that the show has really fleshed that out too much so far either. We have Ginger Gonzaga as Jen's friend Nikki, who is Jen's friend. That's pretty much all I know about her. And then we also have Dennis the misogynist, who is a raging misogynist. There's a hot chick over there, I'm gonna go talk to it. These are both archetypes that can lead to fun places, but I don't think that either character has really broken out of it, and we'll see what happens in these future episodes to see if we give them some more development, because Tatiana Maslany is great, but a great ensemble comedy needs an ensemble. It appears that the Hulk will not be one of those supporting players. We have a brief scene where Jen and the Hulk talk on the phone. There was a very funny joke, I think, that referenced the fact that Hulk was recast in the MCU, complete with a fourth wall break. That fight was so many years ago, I'm a completely different person now, literally. Huh. 
But it's also revealed that the Hulk is on a ship to Sakaar, so I don't really know if we're going to see the Hulk back Earthside this season. The end of the episode essentially puts us right where Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings was with Blonsky out of prison and doing the whole Fight Club thing with Wong. I'm sure there will be many legal complications for Jen to sort through next week as we get into episode three. So those are my thoughts on episode one and two of She-Hulk. I'll be back next week with episode three, then episode four, and then we are in uncharted territory for me as we wrap out the remainder of the season. What did you think? If you were on board with the first episode, are you still on board with episode two? Is the jury still out? Let me know down in the comments below. And before we go, I want to thank the sponsor for this review, Mint Mobile. How many times have you been promised a great deal or even great service by big wireless providers only to find out that there's a catch? So when I heard that Mint Mobile was offering premium wireless service for just 15 bucks a month, of course, that's exactly what I thought. What's the catch? But after looking into it, I found out there isn't one. Mint Mobile's secret is that they're the first company to sell wireless and service online only. They cut out the cost of retail stores and pass those sweet, sweet savings directly to you. For anyone who hates their phone bill, and who doesn't, Mint Mobile offers premium wireless for just 15 bucks a month. They also give you the best rate whether you're buying for one or a family, and at Mint Mobile, families start at two lines. All plans come with unlimited talk and text, plus high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. And you can use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and keep your same number along with all of your existing contacts. To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash Merle. That's mintmobile.com slash Merle, M-U-R-R-E-L-L, to cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash Merle. Thanks so much to Mint Mobile for sponsoring this review, and thank you for watching. I'll be back very soon with more movie news, reviews, box office, and more. Until then, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Bye.